Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. God bless you. And thank you for joining us as we continue our sermon series that we started on perspectives with Easter. What did they see that we Last week, we talked about Pontius Pilate and how he saw Jesus and what he missed out on. Because all he saw in Jesus was a problem he didn't want to deal with. Well, now we're going to continue. And as I talked about the sermon series and shared it with my wife, she says, we're just talking about all the bad guys. Well, to start with, and we're going to, by and large, deal chronologically. And as we move on, we're going to talk now about Herod. Uh, but not that Herod. We're going to talk about a different Herod. The Herod you're thinking of is long since dead. See, there's there's about five Herods in Scripture. There's a lot of Herods, right? All right. Of course, one of them is a famous uh, department store in England. No, not that. No. One of them where you get No, that's Jared. No. So we have many Herods in the Bible. The one that you're thinking of mostly is Herod the Great, All right, which is a very interesting name for him because he was not. This was the Herod who heard that the son that they had been expecting, the Messiah, the newborn king, has come, and so he immediately tries to kill him. That's Herod the Great. Shortly after that, he dies, and that's the end of his story. Well, after him um, comes his son, which is uh, Herod Philip. But Herod Philip isn't in the picture for very long. In fact, he's kind of pushed aside. He's, he's not going to be allowed to be king because, well, his dad didn't like him anymore. And so interestingly, the most important thing that we know about Herod Philip is that Herod Philip was the husband of Herodias. Yes, there's Herods, there's five Herods, and there's a Herodias too. A lot of name similarity here. Well, he was a, she divorced him so that she could marry Herod Antipas, which is the one we'll be talking about right now. Herod Antipas, who of course sounds like he's an appetizer in a fine Italian restaurant. <laughs> but after him will come also Herod Agrippa. Um, he's the one that we see in the book of Acts who's responsible for the murder of James, the martyrdom of James, and the arrest of Peter. Um, and he definitely goes far into the deep end. It does not end well for him. And the, but following him comes Herod Agrippa II, the sequel. But Herod Agrippa II actually works out. He works in Paul's favor. And hearing his court, this is the most kingly of all of them, actually judges justly when he recognizes there's not enough evidence for him for Paul to be condemned. Would have released him, it says. But Paul had already killed the Caesar, so he had to give him over to Caesar. So those are the five Herods, and we're going to zoom in to the middle one, which is Herod Antipas. All right? The most famous thing that Herod Antipas is known for is, of course, the death of John the Baptist. And whenever you think of Herod Antipas, you know, whenever his name pops up in your mind, you ruminate about this guy, which you probably haven't wasted two brain cells on all that much, it's really going to be dealing with the death of John the Baptist, which, fortunately, Brother Porter was able to sow the seeds and, and talk about it in great length for the Sunday school for the adults this morning, but we're going to zoom in on some stuff because there's some key elements that are seated for us in Mark chapter 6 that we're going to carry with us into uh, the Gospel of Luke where our key text is going to be today. So in Mark chapter 6, we see the death of John the Baptist, and interestingly, they tell it to us from the perspective of it had already happened. You see, because Herod is going to hear about Jesus, and then hearing about Jesus is going to ruminate about John the Baptist, whom he has slain. It says in Mark chapter 6, verse 14, King Herod heard of it, for Jesus' name had become known. Some said, John the Baptist has been raised from the dead. That is why these miraculous powers are at work in him. But others said he is Elijah, and others said he is a prophet like one of the prophets of old. But when Herod heard of it, he said, John, whom I beheaded, has been raised. For it was Herod who sent and seized John and bound him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, because he had married her. For John had been saying to Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. And Herodias had a grudge against him and wanted him to put to death, but she could not. For Herod feared John, knowing that he was a righteous and holy man, and he kept him safe. When he heard him, he was greatly perplexed, and yet he heard him gladly. So the way that we're really introduced to Herod Antipas, how he comes into the story, it is one who is a sinner. A one who has taken his brother's wife. See, Herodias had divorced Philip when apparently they had a relationship before the divorce. And now she had gotten with his brother. And now she is now the wife of Herod Antipas. And this was not lawful. It was unrighteous. And John the Baptist did something that churches today won't do. And that's a controversial thing. Offend people. Call people out for their sin. Which we're not supposed to talk about sin anymore, right? We're supposed to just make people feel comfortable in everything that they do. Comfortable in where they're at. Comfortable in their sin, right? So that way they never change. They don't grow in Christ and nothing ever happens, right? That's the purpose of the church. 
That's why Jesus Christ died. That's the reason why Peter martyred the rock upon which the church was built, right? Because we don't want the world to change. We want it just to be the same sinful dark place that it is at all. Nope. No! Oh, I'm sorry. All right. Well, let me change the direction of this sermon then. The point is we're supposed to be challenged or we won't grow. We're supposed to be called out or we won't know what right is. And we'll just keep doing the wrong thing. The fascinating thing is Herod, when he was called out, he actually listened. It says he was perplexed, and that's fair. I mean, the disciples that were walking with Jesus were perplexed, even when he was explaining what the parables meant to him. But he was perplexed, but still, he was glad to hear from him. He took joy from his, his conversations with John the Baptist. He kept him safe, for he feared because he was a holy man, a righteous man. He knew he should do no harm to him because God was with him. Herod wasn't exactly on the right side of God, but he knew what the right side of God was. And he knew at least enough to know that he should ought to want to be there. And as he had conversations with John the Baptist, you can even see it in the course of this paragraph, that John was having an effect on his heart. That John was changing him. That John was leading him to righteousness and truth. And as a consequence of that, Herodias is the one that wanted John the Baptist dead. Because that would mean that her position, her place, was going to be in question. And Herodias had no heart for this righteous man, but the God who had sent him. So Herodias tricks Herod, to, to, in order to hit the head of John the Baptist very famously, because Herod does what a lot of other great men in history, like, like Jephthah, as we talked about in the men's group on Thursday, did with his hasty vow, did. Like Ahasuerus, uh, the, the husband of, of Esther, did with the great lofty um, a promise that he put forward there. Like we see with Darius, who was the king, who put forward his own laws before he really understood the consequences of what would go on. He, they were manipulated into something that they weren't expecting. With Ahasuerus' example, it worked out, but with the other something terrible happened as a consequence because of hasty vows and unintended consequences. Here, Herod Antipas, he puts forward a hasty vow, you know, whatever you want, you know, up to half my kingdom, he promises to Salome, his, his stepdaughter, and she asks for the head of John the Baptist. And now he has to keep his word, no matter what the consequence was. Right? They have to go forward and keep his word because a word once given, you can't undo it, right? You can't break it because you'll look bad. And so for the sake of his glory, for the sake of his own honor, he's going to take the head of the man he he knows is righteous and does not deserve death. And as a consequence of that, John the Baptist dies. But also as a consequence of that, we see the fear that, uh, that Herod had for John the Baptist did not die with him. For he now hears of this righteous man, this holy man named Jesus, who's going forward and doing things greater than John. And he assumes that it is John the Baptist returned from the grave. And as a consequence of that, that is going to shape the way that Herod Antipas sees Jesus Christ. Now, they won't encounter each other for a very long time from the death of John the Baptist until the death of Jesus Christ. So turn with me to Luke chapter 23. In Luke chapter 23, we're going to continue the story. There's going to be a little overlap with what we were talking about with uh, Pilate last Sunday. But bear with me for a couple verses so we can set the tone, the context, and we can see where we are as this inset within Pilate's story. All right? Luke chapter 23, verses 1 through 7. This is after he's been arrested. It says, Then the whole company of them arose and brought him before Pilate. And they began to accuse him, saying, We found this man misleading our nation. And forbidding us to give tribute to Caesar and saying that he himself is Christ the king. Of course, that is a lie, the, the tribute to Caesar part, because he is the one who famously said, render unto Caesar Caesar's. But the Pharisees aren't ones to let the truth get in the way of their narrative, and they want to make sure that Jesus will die. So they're telling Pilate whatever they think he needs to hear. Verse 3, and Pilate asked him, are you the king of the Jews? And he answered him, you have said so. Then Pilate said to the chief priests in the crowds, I find no guilt in this man. But they were urgent, saying, He stirs up the people, teaching throughout all Judea, from Galilee even to this place. When Pilate heard this, he asked whether the man was a Galilean. And when he learned that he belonged to Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him over to Herod, who was himself in Jerusalem at that time. You see, at this time, we don't have a clear top-down hierarchy as we tend to expect things. With jurisdiction of a, a mayor, and then we go up to you know county, and then we go up to state, and then we go up to nation. Those kind of clear angles. Uh, Judea was under what was referred to as a tetrarch, which was four rulers. Judea was was so conflicted and, and convoluted and, and, and catastrophic that in order to keep it under reign, they split it into four and hoped that that would allow them to rule things in order. Right. 
Well, it's hearing that he was from Galilee, Galilee fell under the jurisdiction of Herod Antipas. So Pilate did what Pilate was trying to do, as we discussed last Sunday, figure out a way to make this not his problem. Figure out a way to make sure that he doesn't have to do anything. So he hears he's a Galilean, and immediately he's like, well, I'm done with this. Send him to Herod, because he's one of Herod's subjects. So off he goes. He sends him away. And what's interesting is this is, as I said, a story within the story. This all takes place within what's going on with Pilate. And it's very easy for us to, to kind of skip over it. In fact, many times when you hear the, the narrative of Jesus when he's arrested, very rarely do we go with him to Herod. That usually gets skipped over in adaptations and plays and films, and we just try to keep to the meat and kind of keep it kind of streamlined. This may not, you know, trigger for you, may not be familiar enough with the, with the material I'm about to reference to understand, but those with the ears you hear will get this. Herod Antipas is like the Tom Bombadil of the story. Anyone who's familiar with the Lord of the Rings understands that when we get into the Fellowship of the Ring, Tom Bombadil's several chapters, an interesting character, and they run and they do great and fantastic things, but then he kind of just whoop and disappears from the story and is never mentioned again. And you see in those adaptations that he's just kind of skipped over to keep things streamlined, right? And the same way Hera is usually skipped over too, but when we do so, when we skip over this one place that only takes place in the Gospel of Luke of the four Gospels, talking about Jesus' arrest and trials, is that we miss a key component here, because here... With the story of Herod Antipas, we get emphasized for us the guiltlessness of Jesus. For Jesus was judged by Pilate guiltless three times. But oh, by the way, he even outsourced it and sent him to another guy, another king. And that king, who had nothing to do with him and gained nothing from it, also saw in Jesus no guilt. And so we see even more emphasized that on Good Friday, the double jeopardy that was taking place for Jesus. He was judged three times by one man. He was judged by another man entirely. And everyone is saying he's guiltless. And yet, and yet he still goes to the cross and die. And yet he's still a problem of the world that justice was in the way. So let's push that out of the way. This emphasizes for us, again, the innocence of Christ. Because he didn't die because Jesus deserved to die. He didn't die because Jesus needed to die. He didn't die because it was legal for him to die. He died for our sins and for our guilt and for nothing else. Now, the story continues with Luke 23, 8 through 10, when we finally see Herod Antipas. Begin with verse 8. When Herod saw Jesus, he was very glad, for he had long desired to see him, because he had heard about him. And he was hoping to see him some sign done by him. So he questioned him at some length, but he made no answer. The chief priest and the scribes stood by vehemently accusing him. So we get this interesting juxtaposition. Here we see that the, the chief priests, we see the scribes, we see the Pharisees in their conspiracy doing anything and everything they can to get him killed. They're yelling, they're being vehement, they're very, very passionate and seeing what we've already been demonstrated early in this chapter are lies and slander and libel and accusations, anything that they can say to get him killed, and they're frothing at the mouth, and here he is just standing. Silently, making no response, making no answer. Continuing what he'd been doing since that Thursday night when he was arrested, because when he was in their clutches and before their kangaroo court and their trial in the middle of the night, which wasn't lawful, as they arrayed many false witnesses against him, he said nothing. And when he goes before Pilate, and Pilate continues to ask him, are these accusations true, and tries to levy against them to try and get any evidence out of Jesus, Jesus either says nothing or says something terse, or simply says, you have said it. And before Herod Antipas, Jesus gives no answer. But what he does is go before him, and what Herod Antipas asks is for a sign. Show me a sign. He was glad to see him, hoping to see a sign. Now we have to be careful about asking signs from God. There was a man, he was, he was troubled, he had a, a choice between two options. He didn't know which one he should take. One seemed easy, one seemed hard, but he thought that might be the one that God wanted, and he wasn't sure. So he's on his knees at his house, and he prays before God. He goes, Lord God Almighty, I, I, you know my trouble, you know my question, you know that you have choices before me. I want to do your will. If this, if this harder route is, is the thing that you want me to do, show me a sign. And as soon as he said that, thunder pealed from what used to be a blue sky. Thunder pealed, and a great heavy roll of it comes in, and a heavy deluge comes down. And the man on his knees says, just Lord, any sign at all. 
any sign at all that you can give me so I know that this is what you want me to do. And at that point, the earth shook and the quake, and the earth shook so hard and terrible that he felt the rumble that everything that was on a horizontal surface in his house shook and fell. And he says, Lord, just any sign at all. Just give me a sign because I want to do your will. And if you just show me with clarity, then I'll know exactly what you do. Just give me a sign. At that point, a great and mighty wind blew the roof off of the house. And then he saw that even though the roof was no longer in the house, that there was a perfect donut shape hole in these storm clouds where a beautiful crystal clear blue beam of light was coming down from the heavens and bathing upon him and the guy says any sign at all I'll be looking for it Lord amen <laughs> he asked for signs but are we looking for signs wow. Gideon asked for a sign didn't he he asked for a sign, even though he had just spoken to God. God called him. God commissioned him. Gideon did everything in his power to get out of that in the conversation. But still, he's like, all right, I got to do this. Lord, just give me a sign. If you could just make it show that there's there's dew all over the ground, but, but, but you know, not on, on the fleece, then, then boom. Then I'll know, right? And then what happens? God gives it to him. And then he says, J just to be sure, because I don't want to make sure I missed the sign. Just in case it was happenstance, let's flip that. Let's reverse that on the next. Day. Give me another sign. All right, Lord. Why? Because Gideon was dragging his feet. Why? Because that guy in that story was dragging his feet. Why? We don't need signs, beloved. We don't. Because the Holy Spirit is already talking into us and telling us what we need to do. It's just that he tells us to do something we don't want to do. And then when we're told to do something we don't want to do, that's when all of a sudden our queries and our thirst for signs come. Because we need clarity, Lord, to make sure I'm going in the right direction. We know what the right direction is. It's right here. You know, on the men's group on Thursday, I was saying, you know the amazing thing that God never tells us to do? He never says, figure it out. He never says, you know, you've got to figure it out and, and discover for yourself what right and wrong is. He never, never tells that to us. What he tells us is to look to him, look to his word. Every answer to every question you haven't asked yet that you need to know to know where to go is right here. The thing is, we know what right is. We just know that right is also hard. So we want to look for an hour, or at least an excuse to wait on the going forward. Herod Antipas knew what right was. He did. He was right, even though he wasn't himself a Judean, he was, he was an Adamean, but they still knew what the word was, and they knew what the law was, they knew what right and wrong was. But he chose wrong. And to get out of the wrong would have been very wrong. So he chose to drag his heels. He was still perplexed with great joy whenever he spoke to John the Baptist. And then all of a sudden comes the desire for John the Baptist's head, which he knew was unlawful. He knew what the right thing was in that situation to do. He absolutely knew what the right thing was. It was what he didn't, what he wanted to do, but he was trapped by his own word, and he felt that that was more important. So he does the wrong thing. And here comes a man, an innocent man, a man who by reputation has only ever done good, and his life or death is in his hands. And what does he ask for? A sign. He doesn't need a sign. He needs a spine. <laughs> Love it. We don't need a sign. We need a spine. We need the courage to have the conviction to do the hard, right thing. Amen? Amen. Isaiah 53, 7. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened out his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. The irony was, Jesus was giving him a sign. It just wasn't the sign that he wanted. By refusing to answer these unnecessary questions, he was demonstrating he was the very person, the man of sorrows, that Isaiah had prophesied centuries before. The sign of Isaiah was right before him. He just didn't have the eyes to see. Beloved, I wonder how many times the sign that we need is right before our very eyes, but we fail to see it. How often are we in the presence of God and we look away? Luke 23, verses 11 through 12. And Herod and his soldiers treated him with contempt and mocked him. Then arraying him in splendid clothing, he sent him back to Pilate. And Herod and Pilate became friends with each other that very day. For before this, they had been in enmity with each other. Interesting fact about zebrafish. I don't know if it's specific to zebrafish. But they did an experiment where they got a zebrafish drunk. I don't know how you accomplish that task. 
where they got a zebrafish drunk and they put it in a fresh bowl with sober zebrafish. And as it was flitting around erratically and going back and forth, every single one of the sober zebrafish in the bowl followed the drunk one. Mirrored him exactly and copied all of his moves. That is our tax dollars at work. <laughs> but I appreciate the four to five, we get six figure salary that was afforded for this experiment because it gave us this wonderful example to understand something interesting. You know that famous mocking that was living upon Christ on Easter weekend, where they arrayed him in purple and they say, Hail the King of the Jews, and they beat him. And they make a crown of thorns and put it upon his head and they mock Jesus. You know who they got the idea from? Herod. You see, before Pilate has his men do it, or Pilate's men do it without his insistence, first Jesus, before Herod Antipas, once he refuses to answer his questions, well, this must be a king, then they say. And so, to great personal expense, they array him with splendid clothing. They adorn him with purple, scarlet, and crimson thread. And they make him look more lofty, not like a prisoner before, you know, a game before judgment. No, 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 this is a king, so let's make fun of him. Let's mock him. This man who is facing life or death, that shouldn't be a laughing matter at all. Let alone that it is a righteous man, a holy man, a man touched by God, a man who touches people in the name of God, and they have been healed and transformed and better, and they mock him. But that's not something we are unfamiliar with in the world today. Because in the world today, the most likely opportunity that you're going to have to hear the name Jesus Christ in the public sector is going to be as the butt of a joke. I used to love stand-up comedy. Now my favorite game whenever I put on a stand-up comedian is, let's see how many minutes I can go before he makes fun of God. With a, a cheap shot, no reverence, no regard, and just a baseless attack for someone who's only ever done good for us. For someone who, by definition, is only ever good. If you say Jesus Christ with reverence and love, you'll be shushed. You'll be told to be silent. You'll be told that's offensive. But you can offensively say Jesus Christ as a swear word. And that will be accepted. You can hear that on TV. Regular, basic TV. That's okay. Mocking comes as a direct result of the silence of God. He makes him like a king when his father did everything in his power to ensure that he wouldn't be a king. But he does so sarcastically. Do you think sarcasm has any place in worship? Do you think Jesus Christ deserves any of our sarcasm? Snide comments. Even if he wasn't God himself, just for the life that he lived and what he did for others. Even if you couldn't see the divinity in him, surely you could see the goodness and the righteousness. And now of all times is not the moment. And yet, all Herod Antipas has for Jesus is ridicule, scorn. And I'll tell you why. Because Herod Antipas, arrayed as he was in his splendor, after all, it was, it was a holiday. That's the reason why he was in Jerusalem. It was the Passover. It was a celebration. They come to him, and I guarantee you, within his palace, a party was going on. And here comes the wonder worker. Here comes the entertainment. Here comes the show. But he's not giving us a show. So we'll make him a show by mocking him and ridiculing him. This is the competition. This is who my father was afraid of. This is the so-called true king. And they couldn't see anything kingly in silence, which is terribly ironic. Because the reason why Herod Antipas could not recognize a king in him is because Herod Antipas had no idea what a king was. Though he was raised to be one, though he was in effect one, he saw in Jesus nothing of himself didn't go in the right direction with that particular question. William Shakespeare said in, uh, oh, I can't remember which one it was. But anyway, he said, uh, the fool doth think himself wise. As you like it, there you go. The fool doth think himself wise. And I guarantee you, you have had a conversation with a stone-cold fool 
because I knew the answers to everything. Guaranteed. You may have been that person. Moving on. So, the scriptures say in Proverbs 26, 12, do you see a man who is wise in his own eyes? There is more hope for a fool than for him. Herod Azabas couldn't recognize anything of himself in Jesus, and so he thought himself not a king, thought himself something worthy of ridicule. The reason why he saw nothing of himself in Jesus is because he was standing in the presence of what a real king was, and he had no idea what that was. He was standing and staring at the real thing, and because he was so used to the counterfeit, he couldn't recognize the real thing before him. Right now, my wife and I have a bit of a love affair with the state of Montana. It's beautiful. It's, there's, there's a purity to it. It's, but people keep liking it and moving there, and we're going to lose a little bit of that. But for now, there's, the, there's this clarity to it. There's a place up in, in northwest Montana. It's called Flathead Lake. Flathead Lake is water. It, it comes from glaciers. The water is so crystal clear, pure, that when you're on it, you can see the very bottom of it. It looks very shallow. But it's by looking so shallow because of the purity of it, it's actually 370 feet deep. That's more than a football field, by the way. That's how we measure things in America, how many football fields is it? But because of its purity, it comes off shallow because you expect a little bit more. The more that you expect is actually impurity. See, the impurity gives us a frame of reference to be able to see the depth in it. But it's so crystal clear, it seems shallow. Beloved, do you not understand that the simpler something is, the purer it is, the deeper it is. And that's the same thing with God. God simply says right is right and wrong is wrong. And so people with snide scoring go, well, that's oversimplifying a very complex problem. No, the complex problem is you want to have excuses to have sin. The complex problem is you want to have excuses to behave different ways in different scenarios when God says simply right is right and wrong is wrong and those don't change. And that's actually much deeper to examine the purity of that than it is to live our lives asking for signs and dragging our heels because we want excuses to do what we know is not true. Right before him, for Herod Antipas, is the depths of God Almighty. You know how much strength, how much courage, how much conviction it took him to say nothing while those lies were levied against him. That was a king. But it seemed shallow to him. And so he missed out on the side. Beloved, we should cherish the simple. We should cherish the pure. We should cherish the good. We shouldn't mock it. Now we're going to jump back a little bit to Mark 8. In Mark chapter 8, we're going to have something that's going to help us to understand what the problem that Herod Antipas had. Jesus, right after he fed the 4,000, not, not to be confused with the feeding of the 5,000, that's a different event. After he fed the 4,000, he has a conversation with his disciples. Says, you know, they, they get on a boat, they forgot to bring any food, they're worried about the food. And then Jesus simply says to them, and he, Mark 8, 15, and he cautioned them, saying, Watch out, beware the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. Leaven, if you're not familiar with that, leaven is, is, is an agent that you put in a carbohydrate into dough so that it will rise and grow and become full. If it's unleavened, you're going to have thin and flat and crisp like a cracker, right? If you want a big loafy bread, put leaven in it. In fact, for the Passover, which is where in which Jesus dies, one of the things that uh, was required is that for the weeks prior, you were supposed to brush out all of the leaven out of the house. All of the leaven had to be removed because part of the Passover is celebrated when they were able to flee from Egypt, the exodus of the slaves, and in which they were told by God not to leaven the bread because you don't have time for it to leaven. You have to unleaven bread and eat it and be ready to go. Because when I say it's time to go, it's time to go, right? And so all the leavening had to be removed. So there's a great deal of symbolism involved with leavening. In the midst of them talking about we don't have any bread, Jesus warns them about the leaven of the Pharisees and of Herod. And the disciples being the disciples are like, Worried about our bread, you know, missing entirely what he's actually discussing here. All right. Now, I would also have you understand another little story that helps us understand how leavening works and why it's so important to brush it all out. There's a man by the name of Tom, Thomas Austin who lived in Australia. In 1859, he brought with him to Australia 24 rabbits. And he said, 
it's not going to cause any problems with the, the local biosphere. And it's going to give me a little reminder of home because we love rabbits. And maybe a spot of, of hunting, too. And that'll be nice and charming. All right? And so what harm could it do, right? It's just on my property. It's only two dozen. That was in 1859. In 1920, that's 100 years ago, though. In 1920, the population of rabbits in Australia was 10 billion. With a B. If you want 10 billion rabbits, all you need are two dozen and about 60 billion. Right. Just a little bit, right? What harm could it do? And rabbits, living up to their reputation, <laughs> definitely flourished in Australia. Beloved, a little bit of leavening in the dough leavens the whole mint, does it not? So what is the leaven, then, of the Pharisees and Herod? What is he talking about? Well, let's read the context. Context is king. Context always explains to us the situation. It says in Mark chapter 8, if you just go back three verses before that, verses 11 through 13, it says, here's our context. The Pharisees came and began to argue with him, seeking from him a sign from heaven to test him. And he sighed deeply in his spirit and said, why does this generation seek a sign? Truly I say to you, no sign will be given to this generation. And he left them, got into the boat again, and went to the other side. See, beloved, remember the context of our context is he just fed 4,000 people with not enough food to feed four. And there were leftovers. Here come the Pharisees asking for a sign. Where were you? Demanding a sign. And it is in this context, with a wicked generation demanding signs, that he says, Beware the leaven of the Pharisees and of Herod. And the leaven, that little bit that gets in the mix and corrupts the whole lot of it to be like it, is desiring a sign. Pilate got a hold of the leaven of Herod, didn't he? Because he followed after Herod's suit in the mocking of Jesus Christ when it should be a somber affair. <coughs> I need us to understand something. That when they're asking for a sign, it says that he sighed deeply. They managed to exasperate the Prince of Peace by demanding a sign after he fed 4,000. There are things that are of great and significant import that you do not want to be remembered for having done. And exasperating Jesus Christ is not something you want on your resume. So let us remember that when we say, Lord, I just need a sign. What more sign do you need? What more <coughs> sign do you need? And as I said, this is distinct, the feeding of the 4,000, distinct from the feeding of the 5,000. Because remember, right after the feeding of the 5,000, which we talked about two weeks prior, was that everyone was one for him after he fed them, show us a sign. We were given a sign by Moses to our fathers when he gave them bread from heaven. And when they, all they were doing was wanting more bread. And the bread of life was standing before them. And when he revealed that to them, not as a sign or as a wonder, but as a universal truth that they needed, they rejected it. Because it wasn't what they wanted. Now you may ask, oh, sure, okay, I can see this. This is obviously the leaven of the Pharisees. They just did it. Why is Jesus roping Herod into the mix? Herod wasn't involved in this particular paracope. Why is he being mentioned to and roped in with the Pharisees demanding a sign? I need you to understand that Jesus is Jesus. Jesus is not bound by the constraints of one directional time. Jesus knows what's going to happen. And right there in the midst of saying that I'm not going to give you any sign, and by the way, beware those asking for a sign, he just proved that he can see the future. When he casually told the Pharisees, by the way, Herod's going to do this too. It just hasn't happened yet. He was forecasting what he had already seen in Herod's wicked heart, of desiring a sign, a wonder, a show, a trick from God. At my beck and call. As if the creator of the heavens and the earth was a stage magician to entertain. And if you have the eyes to see it, Jesus would give us a sign showing it just then and there. Because he called it, didn't he? Beloved, in Matthew 12, verses 39 through 41. Matthew 12, verses 39 through 41. He unpacked this for us. 
So there's another time, it says in verse 38, that some describes the Pharisees answered and saying, Teacher, we wish to see a sign from you. Here's what Jesus said to them. In verse 39, but he answered them, An evil and adulterous generation seeks for a sign, but no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh will rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it, for they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and behold, something greater than Jonah is here. You desire a sign. I'm not going to give one to you Pharisees other than the fact that I will be dead and in the heart of the earth for three days and on the third day I will rise again. That's all the sign you need. Beloved, Jesus Christ died for our sins. That is all the sign we need that God loves us and cares for us and wants what's best for us and sacrifices for us. And oh, by the way, the tomb was empty on Sunday morning to let us know the only sign we'll ever need to know that Jesus has overcome every problem that we face. Every impossible that comes to us is not too impossible for the God of the empty tomb who has overcome death itself. Still, you will hear people out there saying, God hasn't done anything for me. Why should I follow him? Still, you'll see people complaining about their lot in life, their work, their job, their money, how much wealth they don't have, what clothes they don't have on their back, what status they don't have before the world because they want to party and live it up like Herod Antipas. But Herod Antipas missed the boat. <coughs> Jesus gave us every sign that we need to see him for truth. To cherish has given us all. What more can we want? What more can we possibly ask for? A sign has been given. If you have the eyes to see it. And the wisdom, the prudence to not demand more. Herod Antipas asked for him to do a trick. Show him a sign. Buckle up, Bubba. Boy, howdy. Behold, on the third day, you're going to see something you're not going to believe. You want a sign? Wait. You want a sign? Wait until the Pharisees are in a tizzy. Wait until their guards think they're going to be killed for missing out someone that they lost on, that they were required to buy their own life and sure did not escape. Wait until you hear the news that Jesus is not dead. sign enough? Or will your stubborn, stiff neck, hard-hearted soul demand more? And when you tell someone that he's alive, the tomb is empty, there is no body, for he is in heaven right now. And then the world has the audacity to say, well, there's no proof that God exists. Look up. Look at the stars in their array. Look at the sun on its course every single day. Look at the moon. Look at the clouds. Look at the trees and the flowers. Look at the grass. Look at you and the complexity of your human life that you have the capacity to not even be aware of how complex you are because in your, the simplicity of what you experience, you fail to see the depth of what God has made, and then you think it's all by random, by chance, and you have the audacity to say there's no proof that God is. Everything is proof that God is. Is. Open your eyes. Open your eyes and fix them upon the cross. And stop demanding more. Open your eyes and see the nothingness in the tomb because that is what God has rendered death if you would but believe Him. And you will need no more. Luke 13, verses 31 to 33. This is our last little pair of coat to help us round out what Herod saw, and therefore what he didn't see. Jesus in the midst of his ministry, this is ways back before the proceedings, ten whole chapters before he goes before the Herod after It says, at that very same hour, Pharisees came to him and said to him, get away from here, for Herod wants to kill you. And he said to them, go and tell that fox, behold, 
I cast out demons and perform cures today and tomorrow and the third day I finish my course. Nevertheless, I must go on my way today and tomorrow and the day following. For it cannot be that a prophet should perish away from Jerusalem. Go and tell that fox. For those who believe in the myth of hippie Jesus, who's all like, peace, love, man, do whatever you want. He just said, go and tell that fox. I have something that he wants to say. He wants me dead, but here's what he needs to hear. By the way, he hasn't even yet been face to face with me to ask for a sign. But I've already told him the sign that he needs. Because here I am every day going about casting out demons, performing miracles, curing people, teaching, <coughs> healing the sick, the lame leap. And the dumb speak and the blind see. I am a walking, living sign of who I am. And on the third day, I will attain full. And on the third day, I will do my report. So on the third day, I will finish my good work, Jesus said. And he says that I will not run afraid of that fox. Because I know what I've come here to do. Jesus shows no fear and no regard no pain of his own death because he has work that needs be done and he even prophesies his own death in that moment and that Eric has something to do with it he said there's no prophet that is supposed to die outside of Jerusalem. Every single one of them every single one of them was killed by their own people. They weren't killed by foreigners they weren't killed by Gentiles they weren't killed by the people who had no understanding of God they were killed by the very people I need you to understand this. Every single person that tried to get Jesus killed went to seminary. I need you to understand that every single person that tried to kill Jesus was just following the long-standing tradition where Jesus says, was there ever a prophet that you didn't kill? Beloved, we were just talking about this after the service, after Sunday school, before the service, I'm sorry. We were talking about uh, Sunday school and how John the Baptist died. And that John the Baptist rose to be a forerunner for Christ. That everything he did was to lead the way and to get people to understand and to be ready for what Jesus was going to come to do. And that includes his death. To remind them of what people do to prophets of God. To remind them of what a good and just man who follows God and takes it seriously no matter what his culture around him does. And actually follows God. This is what the world does to him. So that when Jesus died, a more righteous man, a more holy man, a more innocent and blameless man dies, you'll know exactly what's going on. Jesus had no fear of Herod. Because Jesus had full obedience to what he came to do. So my question to you then, what did Herod see? When Jesus came before him, what did Herod see? Well, he saw John the Baptist resurrected. And shouldn't that, beloved, be the sign? If he already believes this is John the Baptist raised from the dead, isn't that the greatest sign? The resurrection that he already believed in, and yet won't believe this man before. Because what he ultimately <laughs> sees in Jesus is a novelty. Entertainment. A trick to show. Do something. Perform wonder, cast magic, put on a show. Beloved, he started from a place of fear. He feared to do harm to John the Baptist. But having done harm to John the Baptist, he mistook the patience and the grace of God for weakness. And there's a lot of people, a lot of people who plunge headlong into their sin mistake the long suffering and patience of God calling them back as getting away. And so they go further and further into it. And we see that when you stop fearing, you lose reverence. And once the reverence is gone, that's when the mocking begins. In the Philippines, there used to be uh, fishing is a big part of their commerce in the Philippines. No surprise, they're islands. And one of the ways they would ensure that they could get a good haul was using the greatest fishing lure of all time, TNT. Stick of, diamond does, stick of dynamite does wonders when you try to get a good haul of fish. You drop it in, boom, and the fish even conveniently float up to the surface to get you. Unfortunately, there's some hazards involved with that. Uh, the Philippines decided to pass some laws to say that this is illegal, you can't do that. And so, of course, the populace immediately complied with everything the rest of the 
No, they continue to will now illegally dynamite fish, and, and nothing was stopping them, no matter what levies, no matter what fines, no matter what consequences. So you know what they did instead? They started taking statues of Jesus Christ and of Mary and putting them down into the lakes and the waters and the rivers of the bay. And no one dared drop a single stick of dynamite there for fear of harming their statues. For fear of harming a symbol of God. Or even God's mom. Now when you think about that, I'm sad to say that there's not a single person in this room that believes that that would be effective in this country. But at least in that country, there is still, still a reverence for the Lord. Look what it can do. The reverence for the Lord and how it can completely shape behavior and transform us from doing something to not doing something. That's what fear of the Lord looks like. That's what reverence is. That's what awe is. And in its replacement, we only have mocking and scorn and rebellion in our own culture. That is the leaven of Herod. Levity is the leaven of Herod. Just a little bit of mocking, and next thing you know, that's all we have for Jesus Christ. Is once you start making fun of him, once you start belittling him as just being entertainment, he ceases to be God in your eyes. Beloved, there are a lot of churches that are founded on the idea of Sunday morning entertainment. We're going to put on the show. We're going to have a seamless performance we're not going to give you any time to think or pause and reflect. The word selah, which you find in the Psalms, where you're supposed to allow the words to absorb in you and, and meditate upon them and contemplate on them. We don't want you thinking because thinking is boring and dead air. That's bad because we have ad buys, right? We have TV. We spent money to get on the air. So we have to be streamless and have everything going. We have to have the latest state-of-the-art technology with lasers and smoke for our worship service. We have to sing songs that are more about you than they are about God Almighty, where they're really more about what God God is going to do to you and the benefits that you get from this. And none of it is about reverence and awe for the God who already gave everything. What can we give to him, which is the heart of worship? Amen. Worship isn't about us. If it is, then you're worshiping you. Worship is about God. Worship is, is, is putting to song and word your heart for the Lord. And what you want to do for him, what you want to give to him, what you want to offer him, that you are all shucks. I have something I can give to my God. That is worship. But when we make it entertainment, we well, can't be challenged in entertainment. We can't risk offending anyone because maybe they'll get up and they'll leave and we'll have empty seats in the pews. And we can't have that because that means we'll have empty coins not going into our coffers. And that's what it all comes down to. Entertainment is always about money and about me. And none of it is about God. We have abased the church in America and made it about me. People now come to church and they just want to see what can I get out of it? What programs do you have for me? What free stuff are you going to give me? What can you do for me and my kids and all this other stuff? And no one comes to church anymore looking around and thinking to themselves, what can I do here for the kingdom of God? And if they don't see enough stuff for them, they will leave. Because we have made church about us. Beloved, Jesus Christ went into the temple and he flipped over the tables in his holy temple. What do you think he would do walking to most churches in there? We have to turn it around. We learn the heart of worship. We learn reverence and awe for God. Because it's all about him. We have to learn Reverence and awe for God. Because it's not a joke. We treat it like a joke. Or we treat it like a weekend hobby. We treat it like there's nothing on TV, so let me see what church is that. I didn't like that particular music. That song wasn't hip enough for me, so I guess we'll move on. I need a catchy tune. I need it to be so indistinguishable from pop music that they'll play it on the pop station and no one will know that they're talking about Jesus because they're not. We need to remove from ourselves 
is selfish desire. It comes from the leaven of Herod. And we have to return to what worship is intended to be. And that only comes by seeing Jesus as he is. And no longer adorning him in satire, but anointing him with our tears. Because he's not a swear word. He is the word. Herod saw a jester when standing before him was the king of kings. And beloved, I know we're Americans. I know we have no idea really what a king is other than from fairy tale stories. But we do have a king. A king above and beyond all things. And instead of looking at failed models throughout history, instead of looking at our disappointments and monarchs that we might see today, we need to see the king of kings. Because we do not base Jesus Christ on who Herod Antipas was. We base Jesus Christ on who Jesus Christ is and hold our Herods up to the standard of Jesus Christ. Because he is not entertainment. He is life. Beloved, we should be shocked. We should be scandalized that the King of Kings came and served us. Us. But we should not for an instant confuse the fact that he served us in seeing him as a servant. He is the King. He is the King. And we owe him all our service, all of our love. And we should kneel before him every day in awe that I get to stand before my king. In awe that he would do anything for me, let alone all that he did. We need to break the mold of the modern model of the church. Because Jesus Christ does not exist to validate our self-image. Jesus Christ came and died for us to transform us in his image. And so long as we make it about us, as long as we merely consume the leaven of Herod and make it about entertainment or show or trick or more and more proof that we demand to know we want ever have enough of it. Until we stop that, we will miss out on the King of Kings and who He is. Beloved, He's worth it. He is worth it. He is worth my head on a silver platter. He is worth it. So, beloved, like that man that was praying and he had his two choices and he just needs a sign. We have two choices in this world. We can party it up with Herod Antipas. Or we can follow Jesus. Take up our cross and follow Jesus. You know what the right answer is. And especially when you put it that way, right? You know what the right answer is. Do we have the spine to bear our cross on? Do we have the courage to choose that hard right, knowing how hard that road is? Do we have the conviction to say, Jesus, Lord, dear Lord, you're sorry. You're sorry for those moments when we've made it about ourselves. We are sorry, Lord, for those moments when we have forgotten what you've already done for us and what you are already doing for us and what you have already promised us. And we demand more and more and more. We're sorry, Lord, when we complain to you about what we don't have and abase what we have been given. We are sorry, Lord, when we are distracted and we make it something that you don't intend it to be. We're sorry, Lord, when we demand signs. And ignore the greatest sign of your love. Lord, give us the eyes to see you. And transform our hearts to see you. And transform our ears to hear you. And transform our soul to live you out. Because Lord, I need to stop making it about me. And what I want and what I desire 
because I'll never make it about you until I do. I need to learn the value of sacrifice. I need to learn the cost of love. I need to learn the example that my God has given me. It's the one that I am supposed to follow, to live out, to be. Lord, we have no right to demand anything from you. But we do ask for one thing and humbleness, Lord. We ask that you give us the mind of Christ. We ask, Lord, that you break the chains of this world's backwards thinking that is becoming increasingly selfish with each generation, increasingly all about me, increasingly how dare anyone else succeed, increasingly all about just me, me, me. Teach us, Lord, to look for you, to live for you, to give to you, to be yours, just to be with you. That should be all we could ever want. Just to be with you should be enough. Just to be with you is why you gave your everything. Just to be with you, to be yours. May we relearn our first love and what our true treasure should be. May we not see you as Herod saw it, but see the true King of Kings, the simple, pure King of Kings. And let that be enough. In the name of Christ and Jesus. By the power that your name bestows us, we lift this humble prayer to you. And we know it is heard, because that's what the sign of the cross means. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. 465.